Welcome everyone to No Investment Advice episode two. Uh, we got Trunk, Trunk fan here. What's going on, dude? I'm good, man. Uh, right for the hustle. Elon Musk, maybe best friend. It's a uh, you're the it's a 105th, one hundred and fifth, one hundred and fifth most replied to person from Elon Musk. So. Yeah, if anybody wants to see it, my uh, my cousin pulled a, a a spreadsheet of all the most uh, replied to Twitter accounts for Elon, and I'm number one hundred and five. I'm actually right under Kathy Wood. Um, uh, I should pull it. I'll, I'll post it. People won't believe it. Anyways, uh, that's me, Trung, and then uh, obviously we got Jack. Jack Jack Butcher at Visualize Value. What's happening, dude? Good to be here, gents. Glad to be back. All right, just uh, just to give some ground rules or housekeeping, if this is the first time you're listening to not investment advice, uh, don't listen to anything we say and invest on it. <laughs> it's a very literal name. It's in uh, the name. <laughs> yeah, it's literally in the name. We talked to our lawyers and they said that clears us from any wrongdoing in any facet of life just by calling it not investment advice. Um, so listen, the reason why we're talking here now, it's episode three of a podcast or non-podcast. It might be our last episode. We haven't decided yet. But uh, Jack Butcher runs a business called Visualize Value and uh, a TLDR sells courses about using visuals to convey information. And he also runs a number of other uh, Twitter handles. Uh, just some are general interest. One is for a meme account. And uh, if anybody is not in the Twitter sphere, uh, they probably didn't know or see from Jack's account, but uh, Twitter basically rolled in and took away all his accounts other than his personal account, which is insane uh, because everybody that is probably listening to this or, or is even interested in what we're talking about wants to build a business on the internet or knows people building businesses on the internet. So Jack, you had literally, and you posted in your tweet, your life's work essentially taken away from you or your current life's work. Right. You right. have a kid that's less than three months old and your entire business was wiped by Twitter. So you yeah. are a perfect case <laughs> of building on a rented platform. So can mm. you tell us what happened and literally your, your initial thoughts when it happened? Like, were you like, holy shit, this is fucking ridiculous. Like, what went through your mind? Yeah. Your description of it is, is way more dramatic than how I reacted to it, but it is okay. a very fair description. <laughs> it's, it's like it was one fell swoop. The, um, it is this like the flagship asset in the business, really. Like everything comes through that. It's, uh, where, you know, where all of the content goes through. It does like, I don't know, 20 million impressions a week or something. And it just, switched off like that and obviously it's just taken a hell of a lot of time and energy to build it to that point when i when i got the email i was like i don't know i don't, i i i was a shocked but also like i guess i thought oh maybe i'll maybe i'll be able to resolve this or maybe i'll be able to get it back and uh and then it started to sink in and i posted it and a few people were like oh yeah good luck happened to me. Like I have my, uh, <laughs> two million, uh, follower account just deleted. And if Wait, you, some, you, somebody with a million followers told you that they had got wiped. Yeah. A few people text me who have like decent sized Twitter followings and have built a lot of businesses on, uh, on social platforms. And they're like, yeah, the Twitter policy is like, it's really tight. Like it's really hard to get these things reversed. Uh, and sent me screenshots of emails that they had and stuff. I was like, okay. So I was like kind of um, uh, resigning myself to the fact that this thing isn't coming back. And it was a very quick, uh, what are the cycles of grief? Oh, like acceptance, have... grief. Yeah. And that, okay. So hold on here. Wait, wait, just to really frame it. You, your business did seven figures last year. Mm -hmm. If you did not have this Twitter account for 2021, how much money would you potentially lose? It's hard to say. I think if my personal account would have gone, I'd have been at zero. Oh, like you're, you're That's done. That's crazy. Yeah. That's, That's where fun. all your traffic comes from. Comes from Twitter pretty much. Yeah. 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 And, um, I have a like small email list, but Twitter has just been, uh, you know, over indexed on it for sure. It's the, how, how big's your, how big your email list? Uh, 17,000. Yo, people subscribe to this man's email list. This is, he's got a kid for God's sake. Yo, what's the email? What's the email? Is it visualizedvalue.com? Uh, uh, no, it's visualizedvalue.substack.com. So it's a more platform risk. Oh there. my. <laughs> Even more platform risk. <laughs> hey guys, hold on. I, I know Bilal's talked about this. I mean, Bilal's a creator economy guy, but I mean, we need to talk about 
the Naval tweet from 2019, right? <laughs> building a following on Twitter is building a castle out of sand yeah, as yeah, the implacable know. tide shifts in and out. I mean, this is literally... What's funny with Jack is he made all the graphics for the Naval Manac, which is basically a collection of yeah. Naval, Naval-isms that Eric... Uh, how do you say Eric's last name? Jorgensen? Jorgensen, I think. Yeah, yeah Jorgensen. Yeah. So, man, dude, that's... Fucking ironic, man. I don't know if it's ironic, and, but it's And I think Trung as well, to add Jack, pretty much, I remember when we did our first interview, you pretty much made the big change in your business because of that tweet storm, right? Like that yeah. tweet storm, well, one of the, it wasn't the only reason, but it was one of the, the oh, triggers that you're like. Bolt. Okay, let's talk about it. Leo, let's yeah. talk about, I love this. So we need to pull in, because the Val's basically saying, don't build on Twitter if you want a sustainable business. He says, blogs, podcasts, newsletters, open web, you own it, right? Um, so, but Naval also helped you or, or, or catalyzed you to do visualized value. So how, how did that happen? Like, I'd love you to talk through that. Yeah, um, I think the exposure to the way technologists think about uh, product and networks was just something that I didn't really encounter in my career before reading that. So right. uh, advertising world, it's like brute force, go out and meet people win clients, take them out for a steak and beg them to pay you something. No leverage. Yeah. And then that I just kind of discovered those ideas all linked together. And maybe the most profound was just um, do the work and the network will emerge, right? If you create the work, then the work will build a network. And Twitter is just the I mean, there's an inherent advantage to Twitter because you can connect to people and basically piggyback off their network right. if, if you can plug in and get them to amplify the message. Like so, I'm hopping on your guys' network. I'm, I'm riding Jack's <laughs> coattails like nobody's business. <laughs> Nobody knows this, but I'm not saying that I didn't email Twitter the morning that your Twitter accounts got taken down. <laughs> <laughs> Jack at Twitter.com. Go on email <laughs> <Yeah>. from Trump. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, like all of those ideas definitely catalyzed the visualized value business. And I don't know if that platform risk stuff was in there originally, but that's been like, I think part of the conversation for maybe the last, I mean, popularized by the Trump ban thing yeah. right? and just like totally like in the zeitgeist now. And you're like, oh, you know, if I'm not tweeting anything political or I'm not, you know, enraging any particular group, then I should be all right. Uh, but yeah, these like algorithmic suite, there's no warning. It's just like, boom, you're done. It's and, unreal, uh, man. The only reason, honestly, that it came back is because I've been building an audience, I think, and like networking with people in the technology world. So there's a bunch of people that either worked at Twitter or knew somebody at Twitter that reached out and said like, let me escalate it. But if I'd have been a, you know, meme page from from somewhere that maybe didn't have that like connection to the technology community, then I don't know if it would have been resolved. But you're, you're one degree removed from Jack. I mean, you really are right. Just from, from the Jack Dawson. People you know. Yeah. Yeah. And not that yeah. he's making this decision, right? He's not, yeah, I mean, they're not going to escalate this to him, right? He's getting the Trump file. He's not yeah, getting yeah. the Jack butcher <laughs> file, no. but, uh, but having said that, uh, well, I actually wanted to say something about uh, your realization of Naval and it actually, it's a little bit tangential, but I'll do this super quickly. But I also realized something from Naval's tweet storm too. Uh, and it's exactly what you said. It's how technologists think about kind of media. And uh, so I wasn't an engineer, right? Like I, I kind of like, you know, when engineers were just the hottest things ever, social network comes out, everybody's just minting money in the early 2010s being a software engineer. I mean, Bilal, you must know a million software engineers just laughing, right? Working two hours a week, making like a <laughs> mill. Uh, but like, but, but, but Naval just says, man, you can, like, if you're good at media, it's almost the equivalent of being a, a like a, a top tier engineer, right? Because you can work for any organization. If you're a top tier software engineer, you can literally work for any company in the world, right? And uh, especially if you're full stack, you can do everything. It doesn't matter what company you work at, you can solve a problem for them. Media and attention is the same thing. If you can aggregate attention and know how to use the media cycle and, and are very good at it, you can literally work for any industry, right? And that was just, that was actually my takeaway from Naval. And um, um, I mean, Bilal, Yo, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I was going to say, did you hear about the dude who had a job at Google and Facebook at the same time? They, he was no, working remotely. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a crazy story. But yeah, just the tangential point as well, that is like, 
I think we went through the 2010s where startups kind of took over the world and then those startups became Facebook and you know obviously Google wasn't really a startup by that point. And yeah, we had this kind of big surge and everyone's like, oh, we need engineers. And of course that's still the case, but you're right. Like the difference is not everyone can code, everyone can write, but not everyone can write well. Not everyone yeah. can use the platforms well. So I think you two obviously good examples of this where you've taken your skills, but you've put in so many reps by this point that you're literally tweeting like 20 times a day. And right. uh, by the time you've done it thousands of times, you find your voice, you find something that sticks. Um, but that's the thing. I think a lot of people hear that and they're like, oh, great. Like I can go and do that. But then they don't necessarily realize the work that it takes. So yeah. I think like Jack with you, like you said, it was literally years of time <laughs> spent into this. It was all day for several years. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's a pretty crazy, crazy turnaround. So just to, just to summarize where we're at, you got wiped, woke up your entire business other than your personal account is wiped. Yeah. And you're like, shit, this is crazy. You go through the cycles of grief, acceptance, all that. And then you start pinging out people, you know, they're helping, they're escalating it. And during this time, you are thinking though, like, I mean, what is it? You're just like, I'm just have to run everything through my personal. Is this what it was going yeah, to Yeah, yeah. I think um, like I have the assets offline and the, the amazing thing was like, because like this event could actually play favorably right it's that the attention hasn't <laughs> right hasn't dissipated it's like it's just changed forms almost so everybody right, right, right. Was, i think the crossover between visualized value and the, the, my personal account has to be you know up there 50 percent, something like that so it would have been a loss of like pure reach but the story and the like the um i think the yeah, the story is, but maybe the best way to say it is like that could that could be channeled into the energy that was lost from. Well, you're doing it right now, right? Like you're gonna be making an NFT. I'm sure you are. Are you? <laughs> yeah. I like, think yeah, you already put one, you put one out, yeah. of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like that was actually pretty. They look pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. It was just a screenshot of your um, paid suspended. But for some reason, it still looks good. Like, I think you put a little shadow and it's like, yeah, it's called decentralized. And I'm like, okay, anyone who's been following your stuff knows you're already into this stuff. But this was like the final nail so in the coffin, it feels like. You're real, yeah, exactly. Like, you are, I mean, you, you're becoming the poster child for, you know, platform risk in a way, just because you built such a successful business. I mean, you know, uh, there are others, right? Like, uh, I interviewed um, uh, the lady that started uh, the Shade Room, which is like one of the most, popular Instagram accounts. It has mm. more followers than uh, uh, CNN, BuzzFeed, and like a bunch of other media things combined. I think it's like 25 million Instagram followers. Wow. Her name's Angie Noandu. And uh, she basically went through the same thing with Instagram. She built an account, which was a, a, a African-American celebrity focused account from zero to 500,000 Instagram wiped. And this is the amazing thing. She like to Jack's point, she didn't know anybody at IG. She couldn't call somebody up and try to get back. She built it again from scratch. Wow, that's crazy. Dude, this is so, think about that. Yeah. Look, if you, dude, if I built something up to you, if I built something up to 20,000 and I got wiped, I ain't going back. I'm done. <laughs> I'm fucking done, dude. I'm like, yeah. If I built a 200 followers and it gets wiped, yeah, I'm like, man, man, that was a good run. I'm off Twitter forever, man. So she goes from zero to 500,000, wiped. It starts again from scratch. Um, but yeah, it got, I mean, the, I think Jack's going down the line. I mean, he's an example, a very, very salient example of this. Well, well I think can, also, another, to, to, go, on, go on, go on, Jack. I was just going to say, there's another like piece to it that on the surface, it looks like this very cut and dry thing. But that example that you talked about, I bet you the 500,000 were near enough the same people because the, the brand and the idea still exists in the collective consciousness, right? It's just right. this asset to actually attach yourself to it is temporarily gone. Yeah. So you definitely lose traction. But the amazing thing about it is like, wow, this is like, this is bigger than the Twitter URL that holds it. Like you could figure out another way to get it somewhere right. and people will come. Um, yeah. And, and to your point, like, I would call BS on the fact that you wouldn't start again, Trung, because you just like you'd be able to get <laughs> you'd be able to get way back. If you're getting well, that I mean, dopamine hit, yeah, five a.m. close to where you were in a short amount right. of time, and the story is compelling too. Well, you might just find me on LinkedIn. I might just become the biggest <laughs> LinkedIn influencer. Well, dude. Well, let, let me, Jack. Let me ask you for. Uh, I mean, are you gonna 
mean, are you going to go all in on BitCloud? Is this the end game here? <laughs> my, are yeah, you my, going all in on own platforms? Like what, what are you going to do? What's, what are you doing now? This happened to you. You got wiped. Blogs. No, podcasts, you know, I had know. like a, an irrational moment. I'll send you the screenshot. Maybe we could put it up where I was like, <laughs> I'm starting my own platform. I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who did, who You're did starting you Twitter. <laughs> yeah, dude, I mean, I, mean, dude, I mean, dude, to be honest, you should just, I mean, Jack Dorsey needs to talk yeah. to Jack Butcher, but Jack wants to be decentralized, right? <laughs> he has a, he has a program. It's right, called Bluebird, Blue I think, Sky right? Or something. Yeah, yeah Bluebird, it, Blue Sky. But it's just like, I think way beyond when you actually start to think about the implications of decentralized social and like social on the blockchain, you're going to be sitting in Congress in 10 years with 500 cameras. <laughs> Try to explain what it is. Yeah, 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 like yeah. You've destroyed civilization. How do you, <laughs> how do you plead? No like, way. Uh, I feel so when I saw his decentralized kind of Twitter idea, right? It's just like, he doesn't want to have to censor people. That's ultimately, right. it's too difficult, right? It's a non-scalable thing. So he's like, I'm just going to provide the protocol, which is what everybody's been telling him to do forever. Everybody can just set up their own social networks, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's just going to be a bunch of little small WhatsApp groups or like small chats, right? It's like they're going to be the equivalent of that. Yeah. Um, you're right. It'll but probably think, destroy, one it'll thing probably to destroy add to, society. <laughs> yeah. The one thing to add, I'd say, is though that we kind of, because I'm all for decentralization overall, and it's definitely a big trend we're moving towards this decade. But I think we also realize when stuff like this happens that, like there is some reason they exist in the first place, right? Like even though they're doing an imperfect job of it, like there's the policing that happens. There's yeah. like, cause the one, one side of that is censorship, which we don't want. Uh, and then the other side is like, okay, bots completely taken over the platform. And you could argue that kind of already happened anyway, but you know, it would be even worse if there was no policing. So I guess it's like, how does a decentralized alternative exist? but still protect against those things, which I don't know the answer. If I, if I did, I wouldn't be here with you too. But, <laughs> two words, bit cloud bit cloud. The job. <laughs> I think, I think like one of the thing, like one of the attributes of BitCloud is like you put some economic incentive yeah. wrapped up in it and that does change the behavior, right? If people just like post nonsense or garbage or like stuff that nobody wants to see, it just gets filtered out of existence by the fact that nobody wants to pay for it. And, yeah, but it also is a huge throttle for like getting your auntie to set up a BitCloud account. It's like I'm not paying for this, you know. Like that, that is a huge. I think we massively underestimate the, or sorry, overestimate the percentage of the population that is ready to like put a freaking Bitcoin address into. Oh the, yeah, hundred percent, right? Well, I mean, it's people don't even want to press skip on a YouTube ad, which is free, <laughs> like in five seconds. I mean, the, and there's there's literally a ten dollar alternative to, yeah. to just yeah. pay for no ad. Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> bro. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, that, that's so funny, man. Uh, was it, I just want to follow up because I, I know there's another element about Jack's story that I, I don't I want to make sure that we touch on. But Jack, you have a theory about what happened here. So without poking the bear, what is your theory about what happened with all your accounts, why they got wiped? What's the end game here? Who's the Vietnamese Canadian behind it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? A few conspiracy theories were floated to me. Uh, somebody wants the value handle to do something with it. I worked at Bloomberg for a little while a few years ago and they managed to get at business and you know there's no way that somebody wasn't sitting on that right i don't think it i don't you know it's very far-fetched where it's like somebody wants to handle so let's like cloak this into some because there is some overlap of like visual there's like an aesthetic overlap there's a name overlap there so you know i buy the fact that it got flagged by an algorithm but um i think uh the way it, the way it's like not as fairly treated as like think of it an ESPN or a Barstool or CNN. They got yeah. 15 different accounts that retweet each other and interact with each other. And it's a media uh, network, right? And that was a theory that I've been trying to, uh, you know, make real for a long time. And it's like, you have these associated, you have like a house of brands and they all interact and they have a right. relationship with one another, their network. But I think it's a weird space to be as Twitter to determine what is and what isn't overlapping or it, because the content is different. It's just like there's a visual consistency between them or there's like a mental, uh, like the, the areas in which you're 
touching on content wise are similar but the formats are different and, and i don't know i think that's just a, like a weird call to be able to make but at the same time it's their platform they built it i'm under no illusion that like right. they don't have any sway over that so i'm just like thanks for giving me back the well let's think about i mean if you actually let, let's talk about first principles of their policy right so their policies are and, and it sounds like it all came from the same email so there's one email address like one umbrella has all these handles right let's let's grant them that so if you were to implement a algorithm with easy filters it'd be like okay how many accounts are linked to one email yeah and what the fuck are they spotting i mean that that sounds like 101 how to find a russian like a uh, anti uh, biden campaign right it's yeah, like yeah, that yeah. is like that would be a very simple i mean do you guys kind of agree with that yeah I, as a premise i think that makes sense but the one thing i'd say is that hopefully a human at some point saw this and was like right, right, right. Call. but originally it's obviously the algorithm um but like one of the things that i was thinking is like jack stuff you're like one of the examples of someone that they should be wanting to promote like you're literally creating stuff from scratch you're you're like buildings that you're making stuff from scratch whereas you know a lot of people just post other people's stuff and even that i don't think is a problem that's part of social media but it's like you're literally starting from a blank screen and making turning ideas into visual well it's not just that he's building a business on twitter like jack is mr creator right he's mr square he's mr twitter we just acquired title like he's totally (laughs) moving into the creator economy guy world like and this is jack is like the poster well jack's a poster child for a lot of things now he's a poster child for nft excess he's a poster child <laughs> for, <laughs> for, he's a poster child for platform risk and he's a poster child now for creator economy right uh well actually so i i wanted to drop this as a theory who would want to own at value charlie munger charlie Ooh. munger <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, Charlie Munger. Munger's behind it. Yo, Charlie Munger and uh, Warren Buffett just called up Jack, man. Like, yo, we're not liking, you know, El Presidente on Barstool going after us. We need a handle. Yeah. At value. <laughs> it makes sense, man. It makes sense. We'll see that. Just keep your eyes on it. Keep refreshing that page. You're going to see some. Uh... I mean, dude, that's a great conspiracy theory, dude. Whoever, whoever rules out with value, it's going to be like, I... hey, man. What's happening? I have a bro? feeling. I think I know who it might be as well. And if people have listened to the last episode, which isn't out yet, so they haven't. <laughs> 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 but it will be by the time this is yeah, out. By the time we're listening to this. Oh, you got a name? Remember, well, remember Jack only follows two people. And there's probably, remember, he had a grudge with one person. So we called that, that person out last time oh. when we told him. <laughs> <laughs> and I think somehow they've heard about it and they're like, all right. We're taking this guy down. Let's just report from all these different is places. His name is this. Does his name rhyme with point of failure? And they went out. Marley. <laughs> yeah, Marley <laughs> Hunger. <laughs> Dude, can you imagine Another. if Charlie Munger rolled out with at value? Oh Another my god, dude! Was um the only hidden reply underneath the tweet. So one of my friends who's like deep into the conspiracy theory, like, <laughs> hidden reply, hidden reply. Look at this. <laughs> And it was like, I bet you it's Jack wants to compete with at valuables, which is that Ethereum based, um, you know, the, th- the infrastructure that made it possible to sell his first tweet is at valuables. So the theory is at value is going to be the Twitter. Yo, you don't got, you don't got beef with those guys, right? You're, you're no, kosher. No, no, nothing. Yo, I'm sorry, man. But like, I know people give conspiracy theories a hard time, but dude, Kennedy was killed in a fucking conspiracy, man. Anything can happen. <laughs> if they could take out Kennedy, they could take out Jack Butcher's freaking Twitter account. So, Jack, tell me another thing, because when we when this happened, I was texting with you in the separate chat without Trung, and we yeah. were talking about how, um, yeah, like you were kind of riled up, understandably, right? Like I would be as well. But it felt like it was it wasn't like a straight up anger. It was like, uh, all right. Th- I don't know how to react to it. I feel like you were just kind of in those stages that we talked about before where you just are like, all right, fuck it now. Like, I'm just yeah. going to have to do something completely different. Yeah, I think it like, it's very, it's hard to go back into that mentality now, but it is like, uh, you know, what if you do this for another year and you get it to five times the time, the size it is now, and then it just gets wiped, wiped. out again. Oh like, my God. The, the, the 
it's kind of, I use this analogy with Celia. It's like, if you're in a relationship with someone and they, uh, stray and then, uh, you come back together <laughs> and expect you to act the same way. Right, right. Like, oh, spark, that's a good one. A little bit, you know, like, you're, uh, so mm, are you for an alternative right now? Well, I mean, can we talk, can we, can we, can we talk about what you've thought about other than becoming a full-time NFT artist? What have you thought about <laughs> as an alternative to what happened? Well, I think, uh, just hosting stuff, uh, like taking it off platform, but, it, uh, and pushing to it, you know, use the Twitter network to continue to like build, um, relationships with people, but start to diversify the, like where the assets live. So like owned blog or, um, even minting all of the stuff, right? Like it gives you, it gave me an idea instantly to be like, well, why would you not preserve every single thing you did with a timestamp on chain, whether or not that's something you auction or sell or whatever right. else it ge- it's like, it legitimizes it right in the way that someone will be like, Oh, who gives a sh- who, who cares about the provenance of digital art, or you could just post it on Instagram or Twitter or wherever. Like IPFS is like a decentralized file hosting program where, you know, you put something on chain it's there. There's the timestamp. There's the day it went up. There's the wallet address that signed it. Um, yeah, it's got me thinking about how can you publish to an owned platform somewhere, but also like think about the trend line of where people's attention is like trying to get somebody off a platform that is just loading content at you all day long. Like trying to get somebody off into another platform is just, mental hard right yeah i think yeah. email is maybe one platform sms is another way to think about it but to try and like own a media site of kind of sorts like without a massive team and effort to like drag people over there all the time is is difficult as hell I think. well i know really even that da- gone gone no i was just saying well i know jack is buddies with david perel and, and you know what david would be saying email man yeah. gotta get the email list my email subscribers are worth 10 times more than my twitter subscribers yeah yeah I mean, I that's what he's telling you right just, it's, it's also like the medium that i like to work in like i like the feed the the uh the, the feedback from twitter and the like it feels weird to just send one image in an email it's like uh yeah do i need to like write 10 paragraphs here maybe it's not yeah. weird but like, yeah maybe it's an interesting way to do it because it's different but um that's been one of the hesitations or one of the reasons like email has never been a focus because it's like, Oh, what other stuff can I write in this thing? I can't just send a freaking JPEG out in an email, but maybe I can. Maybe you can, maybe you should. Yeah. Well, well give IG. How's your IG? Yeah. Yeah. IG is already pretty big, right? It's 200 K followers. Oh, it's huge. 230. Yeah. Okay. And so Jack, you tried the, the SMS thing for, for a little bit, right? Yeah. What, what was your like take it's from cool, doing that? The, you know, the, the, the thing that stopped the um, thing that made me less excited about it is that there's, you can't have embedded media. It has to be a hyperlink out. Yeah. That's so kind of shit. Obviously yeah. it's a visual thing and you give the, you know, it, it kind of comes in as this broken, like here's a message and then here's a separate link to the media and it's some ugly URL that they click out to, which is fine, but uh, it's not, it just, it's just not yeah, it's as not elegant slick. as I'd like it to be. And that, that just puts me off doing it um, was that community but, yeah community yeah hmm. man i find uh i know a lot of people are trying it and i get the pitch it just i can't get i can't wrap my head around sms man. i don't think it's a good i actually don't think it's a great platform to communicate with people in the sense yeah. that the reason i don't think it's great is because well i'll, I'll just give you my experience so far they suck right like chris i'm on chris bosch's community sms right, right. i've texted him over 100 times not a single reply <laughs> i will screenshot it i'm like hey man chris just rewatched some of youtube highlights of game 6 2013 amazing rebound in the corner nothing just total crickets (laughs) and it's just him once a week like hey check out my new book or hey i just did this like dude well it just feels that promo by that point right yeah just just answer one like get your assistant to answer me like pretend right and then if you're if, if, if I'm doing a full time, like if I had, Hey guys, hit me up on community. Like I want to fucking answer strangers on my phone. Like yeah. get out of here. No. Yeah. Right. I mean, I do it on Twitter, but it's different. Like SMS is like, I, I, I can't get, I can't wrap my head around it, man. 
I get it. I get the pitch. I can't wrap my head around it. I think also you're probably thinking from your, I mean, I definitely agree. There aren't many, I can't actually think of any examples where they're doing it well, but I would say that I don't know if that's just because of text or that's because of how they're doing it right now. Or like right. the way Jack just said there, like that's a shit experience, right? Like click through community dot Jack Butcher, whatever. It's like, who wants to do that? But like, yeah, maybe that evolves over time. I think the other thing I've seen is like WhatsApp in the rest of the world, especially outside of the US is a little bit better or like some people use telegram but I, I don't love that either but like the difference there is it does kind of come through in like a community it feels a bit more like a group chat because it is right, right. but it's um so something that maybe feels a little bit more like that like and i was in the middle east for this business thing a couple of years ago and i was um speaking to some people there and they said that the night before they had literally bought a washing machine on whatsapp <laughs> and i was like what are you talking about it's the most random thing i've ever right, heard. Right, right. but it's like that's so i'd say like for commerce there's definitely some stuff where it can really work obviously if you're a shop owner you get like 100 percent deliverability and open rates are much higher all that shit but like yeah i think as an individual like the way we do it it's a, it's a little bit different we need to talk about how Bilal just said I was in the Middle East doing business. And how awful <laughs> that sounded. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> just the most. Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, I was in the Middle East doing business. Just you know, buying what barrels. The fuck? What were you doing? What business were you no, doing? It was, were you selling wish... missiles? <laughs> yeah, I, I was know, in that's... Riyadh. I was selling missiles in Riyadh. <laughs> No, it was it was a lot more boring. No, it was it was fun. I was in Kuwait. I was uh, I was teaching digital marketing uh, to some startup incubator thing there. It was it was pretty fun. <laughs> but yeah, it's the most random. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was doing. It was it was pretty fun. I'll probably go and do it again in like Dubai, maybe how's Lebanon. The, how was the food in Kuwait? What were you? Eating? Oh, incredible! Yeah, it was like the foodie capital of of that region. So um, what, what were you eating? Like what was the, what was breakfast? Oh, like they they eat everything. They like just have so much international food. So just like literally any sort of cuisine. I mean, and the local food, like I had some of it, but uh, it was honestly just like every single type of cuisine in the world there. Like, what's a what, what's a local Kuwaiti food? Honestly, I, it was like what you'd probably expect, like rice and and meat and stews and stuff like that. So Delicious. yeah, it's just like yeah, it's it's all good. Anything, yeah. I mean, Middle East has pretty good food. Oh, I fuck um, with the Middle East for food, man. Yeah. So yeah, do was there anything else on on Jack's part we want to wrap up with that or what, how are you feeling now, man? Like you feeling? Yeah. Relieved? How you feeling, dude? We're back, man. I I um, a lot of mental energy being expended on the anti fragility plan right now. What? Okay. So can can you uh, can you reveal anything? The comeback? Can you reveal the phoenix rising up from the ashes, or or you want to keep a little surprise? No, I mean I think it's going to be a slow and steady. I don't think there's going to be any flashbang fireworks. Like just just being a bit more uh, thoughtful about. Uh, making more permanent connections, not relying on the singles point of failure. Right. I've got to try that email thing. Uh, also, I don't know, maybe a web-based version is worth experimenting with. I, I always view this stuff through the lens of my behavior. And it's like the last, I don't have like website bookmarks. I don't know about you guys. Like I don't go and be like, not really don't scroll through this website today yeah. and read what's new Twitter or discord or I'm on zoom or Gmail. Like yeah, and if it's not on an app for me, if it's not on an app, I find it very difficult. Like even BitCloud, like I was going on it in my browser on my mobile phone, but yeah. it was not very, it's, it takes ages to load. Um, so oh, yeah, I feel what, the same. Let me, actually, let me see what BitCloud's at right now. You guys <laughs> keep talking. I haven't checked it in like, weeks. I'm, I'm probably at zero now. One of, uh, one of the, uh, one uh, of the like realizations I had recently is like, you're not competing with, um, you're not competing with content on twitter necessarily you're competing with the like twitter the app if that makes sense yeah like, it's like all of, it's all attention it's it's, it's like where people like spending their time the, and that's why you see long form on twitter that's what, like you know these people that post 80 tweets together as a blog because if they posted it as a blog <laughs> there he is yeah <laughs> yeah they posted it as a blog and put a link they would get five percent of the traffic and engagement on it and I don't know what the long-term ramifications of it are if your Twitter account gets shut off, but um, the incentives that Twitter has created is, is basically like killed blogging as a medium for a lot of people. I'm not saying everyone. Some people are still pumping out blog posts and more right. power to them. No, no, like, blah, yeah, blogs definitely got crushed by Twitter. It's just uh, 
I mean, Ben Thompson, tech writer, writes about it. It's just like the feedback loop on Twitter is just so much faster, right? And uh, and it's like you said, you're incentivized to do everything within the platform because they're crushing. If you put a link, you're fucking Yeah, if you done. put a link, we know that from even linking to the podcast. It's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. it's like you just see the impression numbers are crazy different. So what talking of that, like how would you guys place like podcasts specifically since we're now doing one? Because the way I've always described it is you get the benefits of like 100% deliverability kind of like email. So like, you know, it goes to the person's feed if they're subscribed and it's pretty much uninterrupted in most cases. It's not like an algorithm at the moment though that might change, but but you don't own like the email address. You know what I mean? So it's not like you can just pull that out and take them somewhere else. Uh, Like have you guys thought about it? The RSS feed is almost as, I mean, I wouldn't say comparable to own, only email is the pyramid the pyramid the top of the pyramid right yeah i mean the r owning an rss feed is super valuable i mean uh dan patrick from espn when he le- he just left espn and one of the major talking points i think i think it was dan patrick but if it wasn't i can check it but long story short was he made waves because he left espn and negotiated his rss feed and that's the entire value yeah, that's amazing him, right and like i mean yeah i think uh you're right. You're not going to be able to target at the same degree as an email, but our SS feed is super valuable. So, and so many interesting things with how Apple and I'm mean, asked, but I want to ask you Bilal about it. Spotify is rolling out subscriptions. They're not charging uh, uh, creators of, I think for the first two years, uh, yeah. any cut Apple is charging 1999 just to subscribe, uh, have the option. And then they take 30% first year. Yeah. It's quite a lot after. in your mind. You create a pretty successful podcast. What are yeah. you thinking about that? How are you approaching it? Are you going to turn it on? No, I'm not at the moment. And I I think it's cool that they're doing it. My general opinion on Apple and podcasts is like, it's never, it's clearly not been a priority for them. Yeah. And it's, they're so late with all of this stuff. Like obviously respect the company as a whole, but, and they really kind of like started podcasting in the form that we know it. But like, they just don't really care. Like the app is really, really shit. Like the experience is really slow. They don't really give you any analytics properly. Like they launched this thing called uh, like Apple Podcast Connect. You see some stuff, but it's like super basic and it doesn't even match up with my host numbers most of the time. So it's just, yeah, I, I don't, I think it's cool that you're doing it. It means the the space is evolving, which is a good thing, but you know, they don't need $20. Like, you know what I mean? Like they, they just, you know, and the 30% cut as well, that's like quite a significant cut. So um, I don't know. I, I, I think there's plenty of, like I think Patreon has done a pretty okay job. I don't like their experience, but like I pay for lots of Patreons for podcasters and I get that feed. Who? And Who I, do you pay for? I've never paid for I pay for I pay for Pomp's podcast, uh, but, but he's, well, it's not, um, it's like an audio version of his email. Oh, uh, okay, so okay. I, I pay for that. I pay for like a couple Arsenal ones, uh, like a couple comedian ones as well. So yeah, and, I, and I like... every time you listen to a Pump podcast, you buy more Bitcoin, right? Oh yeah, every morning, every <laughs> <laughs> that's my routine. I just get hyped up on on the day. But yeah, so I, I like that approach. I like that most of it goes to the creator. Obviously, there's a cost to the platform, um, but I don't know. I, I think Apple, especially, like they conceive Spotify competing, and Spotify's done a pretty good job. Like they they're not. I think they can do a better job of like promoting smaller podcasts and helping with like um, algorithm stuff and like surfacing it, which I think they're working on. Right. They um, but that's the big thing. Like all of these mediums, the one percent are like the one percent, and everyone else is just having to fight for themselves. Like that's what, there's not that's really what way to dis- get discovered. About like what is there like an economic precedent for the distribution of attention this way right because it does feel like top one percent can make a living off it and everyone else is like the amount of effort it takes to run a podcast like it's a lot right you you're putting in yeah like it's a lot, so yeah. much prep work for every guest like you know a couple of days a week and if you're not like in a in a um if you don't have the flexibility to do that is the juice worth the squeeze and how big yeah. does your podcast need to be to earn like a legit living yeah. off of it it's a pretty Completely. interesting question. Well, I think yeah. uh, Hunter, I just want to say Hunter Walk, like one of the YouTube or early YouTube guys or uh, uh, investor now, I think mm-hmm. at Homebrew, he was just talking about like, you got to be a multi skew creator, right? Like you got to have mm. many units. I mean, uh, like, well, look at Pump. It's a perfect example. He's got his Twitter. He's got his newsletter. He's got his podcast and he's an investor, right? He's got this whole umbrella that he's doing a million things under. And um, 
yeah, I mean, it is. It just skews so hard, right? There's Rogan, and then there's freaking like, even people with like crazy like good numbers, like they're it's difficult as hell to make a living. Uh, a next item on the agenda, so I don't want us to forget about it. Last episode, we talked about the shit ETF, the piece of shit ETF. We uh, Bilal, Jack, and I are gonna invest uh, nothing crazy, a couple hundred bucks maybe thousands, eh, maybe tens of thousands. We haven't decided yet into uh, a portfolio of just the shittiest stocks ever. And uh, last week we, we determined that, uh, uh, that the cheesecake factory and Jack in the box and uh, another company called anti-technology. Uh, we only picked these uh, stocks because of the tickers. So that's cake, Jack and anti, uh, that'd be our shit ETF. Uh, we're mulling over whether or not to do that. But the other thing I wanted to propose is I got a, uh, uh, the funniest, one of the funniest uh, parody accounts on Twitter. They're writing an article for the Hustle. Uh, that's a uh, Parekh Patel CFA. You guys Based. are definitely seen this thing. Uh, yeah, oh. he's great. Or the guy that, uh, or the guy that uh, Chamath calls a uh, father. So, yeah, it's uh, Chamath's dad. Yeah. <laughs> so Chamath's dad, right? It's just the funniest running for anybody that's the uninitiated. Uh, it's a parody account of a uh, of an Indian uh, uh, financier named uh, Parekh Patel. And uh, it's just hilarious. It went from zero to 260,000 followers in like six months. And uh, it got really popular on Wall Street bets, like during the GameStop insanity. And, and Chamath, the billionaire investor, literally just replies to every one of uh, Patel's tweets with like, thanks, dad, or hey, dad, what do you think about this? So just hilarious, right? But anyways, he just wrote an article for us about uh, five shit coins, uh, Jesus coin, garlic coin, <laughs> is, wait, garlic coin? Coin? is this real garlic coin yeah so i'm oh thinking so we have two options here uh i we're probably just going to pull the trigger because of the cadence of the publishing but we either do our <laughs> shit etf which is on meme stock names so that'd be cake jack and auntie which all have like uh, english idioms like you know eat your cake uh jack it up uh get jacked and auntie up uh or we Go with Patel, who's just a fucking legend, and oh, we, we just buy. Yeah. Oh, we do both. Yeah, oh, we do both. Let's, let's see which one works better. Well, let, let's be honest. We we know we know Butcher probably owns all these anyways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we know Butcher's a uh, uh, shit coin allocation. Actually, Bilal, you're saying last. I week got a couple. Oh, I got a couple. To be fair. <laughs> so you guys might already have this, but anyways, uh, just for the listeners, we don't know when this is coming out, but. We'll, we'll, we'll be dicking around on Twitter with it, but uh, I think you'll be seeing us post a shit, a shit piece of shit ETF. Welcome to join us. Uh, it'll be cool. Start- it'll be cool to have like the time period and like have a race basically to see which one oh, yeah. fares better for six months or three months or we should do it. whatever. Let's do, Let's it. do that. We'll do, we'll do like a quarterly Red update versus, uh, versus TradFi. Yeah, I love, <laughs> dude. This is beautiful. Okay, beautiful. Done. All right. So I don't know when this is coming out. Maybe next week. Uh, we're going to set those two up and they'll be race. They'll be fucking hilarious. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great. Okay, that's All right. Great. Uh, talking of memes, <laughs> um, Trung, you had something hilarious this week, man, with the uh, oh, with your man. startup name and the Lux stuff. So just, I- I'm not going to give too much preface. Just share what you want to share. Just my Twitter is getting dumber and dumber every single day. <laughs> so like... <laughs> If you don't follow Trung T fan, just just please follow me because like I'm getting increasingly dumb on my Twitter, <laughs> but the dumbness is being rewarded by the Twitter algorithm. So, so just on Tuesday, I the dopamine was off the hooks. So I, I had. I don't Tuesday. interrupt you, Trung, but you we're getting like I'm trying to convey knowledge in the most succinct way possible. I'm getting bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trung's yeah. content's just getting juiced, mate. <laughs> yeah, you know, the Jack's trying to deliver value to the world. I'm literally waking up every morning, and be like, "How dumb can I get?" <laughs> the dumbest thing I can put out there. So, I put a, I put out this tweet, and it's just a. I mean, we everybody makes fun of startups and how they name companies and like how they talk about uh, the industries they're disrupting. So I literally just put a, an image of a can opener, like one that everyone probably has in their drawer right now, and I go. Uh, it just goes the, the format, the standard meme format, you know, no one, no one's talking about this. And then startups, and then the startup says, we're called Can Opener, spelled K-A-N-O-P-N-R. We're a hard, smart hardware company disrupting the $10 trillion global food industry. And anybody that's listening to this podcast, in episode one, I talked about how I set tweets so I can wake up to dopamine drip. <laughs> so I set this one for 5.30 a.m., Oh, 5 a.m. That's an early start. I was really going for it. 
I wake up at 6 30. It has a thousand likes. The most likes I've ever had on a tweet when I woke up, I'm like, this thing might get to 10,000. Like, you know, the vibe. And Jack, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when a thing rips that fast and, the, you know, the, the uh, West Coast hasn't even woken up yet, you're yeah, like, yeah. this thing's going to run. This thing's going to run. But it went completely bananas. And it, it actually wasn't like the, the biggest one. It ended up at 6,000 uh, likes. No, not that I'm counting, but uh, it, the. Uh, <laughs> But I just woke up and I'm like, I'm leaning into this. So I just started, I started making logos for it. I made a fake <laughs> ad. And what people don't understand is this. Like, I'm, I'm trying to explain to my wife and my, my family and friends. is like, I'm so fast at making dumb shit. Like, I, it, yeah, it's incredible. I think last week, uh, Tom Osman, I think a friend of ours. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know Tom that well, but he, I think he knows Jack. So I have Chin Math on notification. And Shamath tweeted something and I tweeted out a meme within two minutes. And then Tom just literally wrote underneath. He's like, hey, hey, hold on. We didn't talk about how fast you did that. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you don't understand. If this thing's hit on my phone and I see it, I'm going to be doing this. And like a minute, 90 seconds later, it's going to be out there. What are you yeah, doing? Mematic, I, Trump. Yeah, what oh, were you mat- using? No, for it wasn't even mematic. I, I, I used Google Slide. I got so good at Google Slide and video. <laughs> on shop. the phone? Yeah, on the phone, dude. Like, That's I literally amazing. On my phone can make like. I was, everything on this, uh, we'll, we'll share the tweet, but like yeah. all the fake website designs and and, and uh, logos was all done on my phone. And uh, it's just, I've gotten so, so fast at it because I'll tell you why. Uh, the listeners, if you can't see the video, if you're on YouTube, I used to sleep with my kid, right? So Jack will know this. So my kid will be in my arm like this. So for the first 18 months of my kid's life, he's just in his arm like this, right? Jack, you know what I'm talking about. You got one hand. So literally I'm like, fuck, I want to like, I'm like, I want to make like stupid Photoshop shit. So I literally for 18 <laughs> months got so good at mobile tools. Cause I was like holding my kid and like, I didn't want to wake him. I couldn't use a laptop, bro. <laughs> not so just, this, sorry, not just on your phone, but one handed on your phone, pretty one much. Well, on my phone, wrap right? around, wrap around. <laughs> Dude, Cause my kid would nap for three hours. Like what the fuck am I going to do for three hours? So I just got so good at these apps. And uh, it's hilarious. It's so dumb. But anyways, the, the fruits are being rewarded now with the Twitter algorithm. <laughs> Mate, the screenplay, you got to fire up screenplay for this next time. It's perfect. Oh, yeah. So Jack uh, put us onto a new app. It's called Screenplay. And it's yeah. like a social app where you do shit on your screen and, uh, and you There's just share what you do on the screen. We should yeah. do it live with people who listen or, or people Oh, yeah, I'll do it. Like... You know, okay, I will do it. I'm going to hit up the screenplay guys. To show people up... how they do it. Yeah, yeah next time Chamas tweets, man, we, we want yeah. a strong screenplay. Like, <laughs> so uh, you do a meme competition. That's cool. So uh, that was one. The other one that I wanted to talk about super quickly, uh, not to toot my own horn, Trung T fan, follow at Trung T fan. Uh, <laughs> almost at 50,000 followers, could get wiped out tomorrow, but whatever. Uh, the other one I, I tweeted was, uh, uh, I read this article, really cool article about Rolls Royce's new design. Uh, and in the article, the guy talked about how if you look at all the top most luxury brands in the world, they only use capital letters. I mean, Jack, I'd love your opinion on this, actually. So, but so I tweeted that and I tweeted it in such a way, though, like we want to talk about like the the methodology behind my tweets. I tweeted it in such a way where I would kind of trigger people. Uh, so I put the world's most luxury bands only use capital letters, like a, 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 an authoritative statement, right? Yeah, yeah. And I knew I was going to get blowback. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> give me all the blowback in the world. And people then, so then people, I just give them a reason to reply and quote tweet it, right? They, so they get to reply with, hey, look at this luxury brand that isn't using capital letters or they'll tweet shitty brands that all use all capital letters, but it got out of control. So... <laughs> I have 235 quote tweets on this. It's all, all it is, is an image of a lot of a brand and people will just say like, you know, theory confirmed and it will be like David Buster's like fucking arcade <laughs> It's the world's luxury brand. Right. But I'll tell you, like, uh, I, I got a lot of pretty popular accounts, uh, did that, uh, quote tweet move like PFT commenter from uh, barstool. He has 1 million plus. He put uh, David Buster's logo and he goes, yeah, story checks out. Like, fuck, this is a luxury <laughs> brand. But dude, I started getting a bunch and, this, and then I did one about Wendy's. Wendy's is not all caps. And I'm like, man, there's something wrong with this theory. It's not working out. But the absolute best one I got was uh, a, a, a Twitter handle at can't beat the biz. I mean, this guy probably stole your fucking value, to be honest, man. So suspicious. He tweets out the logo for Brazzers, the fucking porn site, and it's all caps. 
<laughs> so I just go and dude, in the end of the day, after looking through like literally hundreds of other logos that people tweeted as a joke, the theory is completely bunk. It's just everybody uses all capital letters. <laughs> Jack, we talked about this in the past. So um, you and your boys used to do like some sort of jackass or like some crazy show. I don't know if, we're, I hope oh, we're man, able I to speak about this. <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a, um, so this, I had a friend in uh, would be secondary school, high school for all the Americans listening who like was way before his time, man. He, uh, he owned lolcats.com. He made it like, this is like long, long, long time ago. Like, you know, in the late nineties, he's doing like, actually, is it late nineties, early two thousands. He's yeah. doing lolcats.com, which basically is like the, like catalyst for memes. You know, that cheeseburger meme, the cat, the, the Your cheeseburger. buddy did the cheeseburger meme. I don't know if he did the meme, but he started lolcats.com, which is where all that stuff was. Oh aggregated. my God. That's What's he crazy. doing now? I think he's a working. He's a developer in the UK. I, I don't is think his he name got Zuckerberg? Account, so he never got credit for it, man. <laughs> is his name Mark Zuckerberg? No. Well, you know what? Like he's like Flash developer. He's making games and stuff. Like it was just nuts. And he had lolcats.com. Anyway, we had this thing, Jackass esque. It was pathetic. Like you know, nothing uh, particularly dangerous. Just just like a bunch of fourteen year olds being knobheads. Pre YouTube though, right? Yeah. Pre YouTube. Pre -YouTube <laughs> this was like so was, these were yeah. like MOV files hosted on an FTP with with a site that was built in HTML written code. It was a .tk domain, which is some oh classic. Like, yeah, it's free. I used to have one of those. Thing, right? <laughs> it was called self inflicted .tk, self dash inflicted .tk. I think it was, and um, this lad who was the developer. One day he's like, oh boys, I got a new domain, si.com. No, Sports Illustrated. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I was like, well, what? That's mental. And that was like, even back then, it was like si.com. You know, the internet wasn't like a huge part of your life. It's like, oh, that's pretty legit. And I think he held on to it for a little while. And then the freaking domain lapsed. And then Sports Illustrated picked it up. And uh, it lapsed. He didn't even sell it. Right. Crazy. That's crazy. That must be worth like million, like oh, anything oh, yeah. with like one or two, two letters, letters is Only already at that time, expensive. Millions, dude. That's insane. Yeah. Wait, just to confirm. So this is like, this is like part of your first uh, interaction with the internet was your lols cat buddy. And you guys just fucking around buying random websites. Yeah, no, we were like, we were just buying a domain for this project that we were doing this dumbass jackass thing. So we could print it on the flyers that we were giving out at school, self-inflicted. And uh, he managed to get the domain and then- yes, I saw it. Oh my God, dude, that is hilarious. That's so ridiculous. So you guys were filming like Johnny Knoxville type shit? Yeah. Well, you oh know, my... inspired by, but it was horrifically pathetic. Like, well, what, what, what was dangerous. that? Yeah, like what? Like, do you remember some of the, were they yeah, pranks like, uh, and stuff like that? We get in like a shopping bag, like a big, uh, uh, you know, zip up <laughs> shopping bag, like stick it on a skateboard and like wing it down a oh hill my down some God, stairs. Dude getting tractor tires, jump out of trees into ponds and stuff like that. Like it's pretty, you know, rural. That's ridiculous. It was Well, dude, that. I mean, like, let's be honest. Like that's not any worse than I mean, these jackass dude did the craziest shit, man. Yeah, that's oh true. God. Dude, it's peak kind of jackass when Steve-O was like, I'll just tell you my, let, how about this? We'll, we'll end with this. Let's talk about our favorite jackass skits. <laughs> Steve-O dressed as a ballerina, uh, rollerblading into... Uh, the sewage drain pipes where all the piss, urine, and defecation goes into. He was rollerblading into the fucking water. Dude, think about how disgusting that is. So dangerous, man. It's Dude, crazy. if you have an open wound, you're going to get infected. You're, you're going to die. Yeah, you're done. Uh, so he did that one. And actually, my personal favorite wasn't uh, like a bone-breaking thing that was insane, but it's when Johnny Knoxville has a boner and he goes to the gym. <laughs> so he wears a dildo. And it's just so funny, man. He's got the dildo. I'm going to show you guys. So imagine the mic is there and he's spotting some dude. And he's spotting the guy on the bench press. Dude, I'm going to pull the video. We got to watch it. I think I've seen that. I'm pretty yeah. sure I've seen that one. That's ridiculous. Dude, that, oh my God, dude. <laughs> and then he asked some guy to spot him. So he's lying down on the bench. He's got this massive chubby. It's just so fucking funny, man. Uh, so those are my two favorites. Uh, the second one's kind of weird. Trunk, I feel like you did like some pranks in your time, no? For the wrong nothing, nothing like that, bro. Jack, what was, what, on, what was Jack. one of your favorites? 
I was just going to say, I don't know how you remember any of that stuff, man. I was just mental how you've got that indexed. In the- oh, it's, it's amazing. I watched that yesterday. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen it. Uh, well, uh, if you don't have a favorite, let me add a third one. <laughs> the, uh, before they did uh, Jackass, there's a, there's a skateboarding crew. I forgot what they're called, but they had a song uh, that's very politically incorrect. Um, but there's a line in the song where they go, Ho Chi Minh, shoot a load on your chin. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're trying to get one beat per episode so we yeah. <laughs> try I mean, dude, listen, that's above board man i'm vietnamese i can see what i fucking you want can, about ho chi minh man it. uh but ho chi minh shoot a load on your chin i'm like that is an incredible rhyme that's it maybe we should leave on that <laughs> what a beautiful poetic way to finish man <laughs> well what's um, funny is uh if anybody if any of our dozens of listeners listen to episode two then three like last time i left them like the most eloquent thing ever is like life is precious yeah. and, then, and then this episode <laughs> I mean, being a dad yeah i'm like man being a father has just changed my perception of life just listeners just 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 cherish every moment this week ho chi min shoot a load on your chin <laughs> that's range man that's acting range dude all right in that case great way to end yeah another episode not investment advice see you guys next week <laughs>